The new section of the dog fence will cost $25 million. 5,000 kilometre long fence, it's the, the longest fence in the world. A country built thousands of kilometres of fences, not to keep people in or out, but to stop animals. Critics called it absurd, a massive waste of money, an outdated solution to a modern problem. A decade later, the results proved them spectacularly wrong. These fences didn't just protect livestock and crops, they triggered one of the most unexpected ecological recoveries in modern conservation history. Native species that were nearly extinct began returning in numbers nobody predicted. Ecosystems that had collapsed started rebuilding themselves, and entire industries that were on the verge of financial ruin suddenly became profitable again. This is the story of how Australia quietly pulled off a global conservation miracle using nothing but wire, posts, and persistence. And the lessons from this unlikely success are now being copied on three continents. The Accidental Sanctuary Nobody built these fences for conservation. That wasn't the plan at all. The original purpose was purely economic. Save Australia's wool and crop industries from total collapse. But once the fences went up and invasive predators got locked out, something remarkable began happening that nobody anticipated. Native species started coming back. At places like Scotia Wildlife Sanctuary, strong exclusion fences created safe zones where endangered animals could finally recover and breed without constant predation pressure. Inside these protected areas, populations of bilbies, bedongs, and wallabies increased by over 300% within just a few years. These fenced zones function like living laboratories, demonstrating to the world how physical boundaries could systematically reverse damage done by invasive species. The strategy became a new conservation model, use fences not merely as barriers, but as ecological reset buttons. Contain the threat, then rebuild from within. International conservation groups now study Australia's fenced sanctuaries when designing similar projects in Africa, New Zealand, and North America. What started as a desperate economic gamble transformed into a blueprint for ecological restoration. In a world struggling with catastrophic biodiversity loss, that's a legacy worth serious attention. It's, it's, it's longer than the Great Wall of China, but maybe not as well built. The invisible line dividing two worlds. The dingo fence stands as one of the longest man-made structures on the planet. It stretches over 5,300 kilometers, starting in Jimbor, Queensland, cutting across New South Wales, and extending all the way to the cliffs of the Great Australian Bight in South Australia. If you somehow unraveled and straightened all of Australia's major exclusion fences, they'd cover over one-eighth the length of Earth's equator. The dingo fence alone, if laid across Europe, would stretch from London to Istanbul and nearly back again. Together, these fence networks represent some of the longest continuous barriers ever constructed. But the dingo fence does something more profound than simply keeping predators away from sheep. It essentially draws a biological boundary line straight through the continent, creating two radically different ecosystems on either side. North and west of the fence, dingoes roam freely. These areas maintain healthier, more balanced ecosystems. South and east of the fence, dingoes are mostly absent. Without them as apex predators, fox and cat populations exploded catastrophically. That proved devastating for native wildlife. Small mammal species declined sharply in the dingo-free zones. Satellite imagery reveals stark vegetation pattern differences on either side of the fence. One side shows natural vegetation patterns shaped by predator-driven ecosystems. The other displays neat geometric patches of farmland shaped entirely by human control. Scientists now call it the dingo line, a term that captures how profoundly this wire barrier has divided the continent ecologically. For many farmers, this dingo-free zone represents a lifeline, the difference between staying in business and losing everything to predator attacks. But conservationists argue the fence disrupts natural processes and creates artificial ecological imbalances. Indigenous groups raise deeper concerns, noting that for thousands of years they coexisted with dingoes using traditional land management practices that the fence completely disrupts. The fence embodies a fundamental tension. It simultaneously protects industries while fundamentally altering ecosystems in ways we still don't fully understand. The plague that started everything. To understand why Australia built these massive barriers, you need to go back to 1859. That year, a wealthy settler named Thomas Austin released 24 wild European rabbits onto his Victorian estate so he could hunt them for sport. 
Within just a few decades, those 24 rabbits multiplied into hundreds of millions, spreading across southern Australia like a biological wildfire. Australia proved to be rabbit paradise. Few natural predators existed. Vast grasslands provided unlimited food. The climate was exceptionally favorable. By the 1890s, farmers reported seeing entire hillsides appearing to move, not from wind, but from the sheer density of rabbits covering the landscape. The economic devastation was staggering. Rabbits destroyed millions of Australian dollars worth of agricultural output annually, equivalent to hundreds of millions in today's currency. They caused severe soil erosion. They consumed crops faster than farmers could plant them. The government tried everything to stop the invasion. Bounties, poison, trapping, shooting. Nothing worked effectively at scale. Then came a breakthrough idea. If you can't exterminate the rabbits fast enough, perhaps you can simply shut them out. Construction of the first major rabbit-proof fence began in 1901 in Western Australia. Eventually stretching over 1,800 kilometers, it became one of the longest unbroken fences in the world at that time. Building it was an engineering nightmare. Workers faced extreme heat, brutal dust storms, and severe water shortages while dragging rolls of mesh across unforgiving terrain. Supplies arrived by camel or horse-drawn wagon. Maintaining the fence became a constant battle as shifting sands buried sections and floodwaters washed others away completely. The final cost was astronomical for its era, over 80,000 pounds. But remarkably, the fence worked, at least initially. It slowed the rabbit invasion long enough for Western Australian agriculture to survive and expand, saving tens of millions in crop losses and giving farmers desperately needed breathing room. The fence, um, we're able to grow sheep because there's no dingoes to kill the sheep. And on this side of the fence, they mainly grow cattle because cattle can cope with dingoes. The economic gamble that paid off. When Queensland launched its cluster fencing program in the 2000s, tens, skeptics ridiculed it as a waste of public money. They argued fences were static, expensive, and easily breached. But by 2023, the data told a dramatically different story. Properties inside cluster fences showed livestock losses from predators dropping by over 90% in some regions. Wool quality improved significantly. Lamb survival rates increased substantially. Farmers who faced financial ruin from wild dog attacks suddenly found themselves profitable again. According to industry reports and case studies, economic returns from fencing projects sometimes reached tens of millions in added value. One project in the Murray-Darling Basin was expected to return $15.5 million to the local economy from an $11.1 million investment. Another project focusing on the South Australian dog fence predicted generating up to $120.3 million in benefits over 20 years, including job creation and increased enterprise income, while simultaneously reducing wild dog management costs by approximately $97 million. Towns hit hard by drought and predator losses saw new employment opportunities, higher land values, and dramatically better resilience during climate shocks. In regions previously suffering from kangaroo overpopulation, some fenced areas reduced the need for large-scale culling because they could manage populations before they spiraled out of control. The fences also functioned as biosecurity barriers, helping prevent livestock disease spread and feral pig incursions that devastate crops. For government agencies, the return on investment became impossible to overlook. Western Australia's upgrade of the state barrier fence, adding new sections and electrifying old ones, was backed by millions in state funding because it demonstrably saved far more than it cost. Beyond economics, the fences proved something enduring, that targeted infrastructure could transform fragile industries without chemicals or subsidies, but simply through smart physical boundaries that tilted the scales in farmers' favor. It's a highlight in the middle of a very severe drought for us. The year-round battle. These aren't fences you build and forget. In remote locations, workers endure harsh weather year-round, maintaining thousands of kilometers of barriers. A single break can undo years of protection, so constant vigilance is essential. Maintenance crews called fence runners still patrol the dingo fence today. Their job involves finding and repairing breaks caused by storms, animals, or erosion. They tighten loose wires, repair gates, and check electric systems. It's brutally tough work in extreme isolation, but it keeps the line intact. When the original rabbit-proof fence was completed in 1907, thousands of workers were hired to build and patrol it under brutal conditions, often hundreds of kilometers from the nearest settlements. Supply lines needed establishing, depots required construction, and inspectors were stationed at intervals along the fence's entire length. The cost wasn't trivial. The original rabbit-proof fence cost over 250 pounds per kilometer to construct, 
an enormous sum for that era. Some argued this money should have been spent on modern surveillance or predator control programs instead. For a while, it seemed like the critics might be right, but over time, the numbers told an unmistakable story. The infrastructure investment proved worthwhile not just economically but ecologically. The unintended consequences. Fences reshape more than just keeping animals in or out. They fundamentally alter land use patterns, vegetation distribution, and wildlife behavior in ways that weren't always predicted. The Western Australian State Barrier Fence, originally designed to stop rabbits, became a bulwark against emus, kangaroos, and feral pigs. It successfully prevented crop destruction and disease spread, but it also affected habitats profoundly. Species requiring seasonal migration found themselves blocked. Others that bred freely inside fenced areas created new overpopulation problems. More recent cluster fences in Queensland attempted to avoid these mistakes through more sophisticated design, but critics still worry about long-term consequences. What happens when predator control shifts ecosystems in ways we don't fully comprehend? The answers are still emerging. Outside the dingo fence, livestock losses to dingoes remain higher, but so is biodiversity. Native species like bilbies thrive better in dingo-controlled environments. It turns out dingoes suppress populations of more destructive invasive predators like foxes and cats, bringing natural balance to ecosystems. This creates a genuine dilemma with no easy answers. The fence simultaneously protects agricultural interests while disrupting ecological processes. It saves industries while creating artificial boundaries through natural habitats. These tensions persist, requiring ongoing adaptive management. The global model. 10 years after renewed investment in pest exclusion fences surged across Australia, the results became impossible to ignore. What many dismissed as outdated brute force solutions delivered some of the most significant conservation and economic successes in recent Australian history. For the first time in decades, concrete evidence demonstrated that invasive species control works, but only when executed at proper scale with patience and precision. The approach isn't universally applicable and requires regular maintenance, consistent monitoring, local support, and flexible land management. In some areas, it created new challenges like overgrazing inside fences or requiring manual kangaroo population control. But the fundamental principle proved sound. Physical barriers, properly designed and maintained, can create conditions for ecological recovery while protecting economic interests. What seemed laughable became legacy. An idea dismissed as outdated became central to Australia's land management strategy. Sometimes the simplest solutions just need patience to prove themselves. Australia's fence network started as a desperate attempt to stop pest invaders and secure agricultural lands. Years later, they've proven their worth not just economically, but as instruments of conservation and ecological restoration that other nations are now studying and replicating. In a world facing accelerating biodiversity loss and increasing conflicts between agriculture and conservation, Australia's fence network offers a rare example of infrastructure that serves both purposes simultaneously. That might be its most important legacy, demonstrating that with careful design and persistent maintenance, human economic needs and ecological restoration don't have to be mutually exclusive goals.